Yo, what's up guys? So today we are gonna see, what if, Naruto got hair in Watanada, Tenten, Fu and female Haku, movie. Hope you'll enjoy this video. So before we start, go check out the author of this fanfic MREY4TW. Link is in the description, and also subscribe to my channel, and like this video. Let's begin the video. His clones had dispersed, relinquishing their memories to him that made him aware that they had performed their duties. One had completed writing a letter to his son, one had informed the old man his last wishes, and another carried a baby to his work office, and left a note in a picture frame. He looked down at his chest, and sighed with a shuddering breath. A massive claw had pierced his wife's chest along with his own in their last ditch effort to protect their son. As his life was fleeting, he started to think back to only five hours before. If one had asked him then how he was going to spend the night, the very last answer from the darkest recesses from his mind would be dying. He looked to his red-headed wife, and her to him simultaneously in the eyes. Dimming eyes shared their mutual distraught emotions, their worries, and anxieties strangely, physical pain wasn't even a part of the bandwidth. Their thoughts were communed in like fashion, both joint, as their lives ended with the uncertainty surrounding their son. It wasn't so much for the fact that they were dying, their clothes becoming drenched in a new crimson. It was the fact that they wouldn't even get to live for Naruto's sake. There was nothing for it, nothing they could do to fight it. Darkness started to swim around the edges of their vision, and their breathing slowed, and became shallow. Their bodies finally gave out, as they exhaled one last time, as death staked its cold claim. Minato Namikis and Kashina Uzumaki, two of the finest shinobi of the village hidden in the leaves had died, sacrificing themselves to restrain, and seal the Kyubi no Kitsune, nine-tailed fox, a monstrous beast of staggering size, and want of destruction. Kashina had held the beast in place with her chakra chains, while Minato used a forbidden to seal the fox demon away in a newborn baby, only born a couple of hours prior. His own son. Although this was a decision filled with regret, he knew he had no choice because he couldn't ask anyone else's child to bear such a burden. He knew how hard Jinchkriki, power of human sacrifice, lived, but he was sure he could overcome it. So he sealed the yin part of the demon's chakra in himself, and the yang portion in his son, confident he could overcome the beast's hate, and be a strong shinobi in the future for the village. Kashina had also passed on her birthright to Naruto, his son had doubled the legacies to back him, and doubled the responsibilities that came with it. But there was yet another thing that bothered him. He could always sense his rival, staring at him from his hiding place on the Night of Chaos. His own contender for Yandame who believed in power hoarding, and using whatever means to get it, and keep it, no matter how dishonest or disgusting they may be. Perhaps he knew that he couldn't get his own invented that had long since been sealed when his heart had been dealt a fatal wound. But what of his own son? Hopefully, the latter would be able to figure it out. Time skip. An old man sat in a large office with a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, and slept in a small basket on the desk in front of him. As he sat in his own chair, he looked on at the sleeping infant, and couldn't help but feel envious at being able to sleep just one hour after the end of one of the worst disasters to ever befall Kanoha. The responsibility of having to look after a half-destroyed village didn't mean half as much work, unfortunately, it meant five times the work, and ten times the stress. The man was dressed in simple red robes being overlaid with white ones, along with his badge of office, a dominantly red kite-shaped hat with a white diamond patch at the forefront, with the words Fire Shadow written in red kanji. His face being the only exposed area of his outfit, showed a tan wrinkled face, that had a few liver spots, complemented by a grey goatee, and crow's feet around his eyes. However, it seemed that he had gained a few more wrinkles to add to his ever-grown collection. Here's and Sir Toby was tired. No, he was burnt out. Everyone had a load of shit on their plate, but he seemed to have the biggest portion by far. He gave a weary sigh, as he thought over his problems, while he looked at the peaceful infants. The village is practically destroyed due to the Kyubi's attack, we don't have much funding to fully rebuild, not to mention the loss of valuable lives of shinobi, and civilians alike. Ugh. And there is that council meeting tomorrow, and I have to step back in to take control of all of this. And to top it off Minato-kun, and Kashina-chan are dead. They were the most this village had to offer to intimidate the other villages, so they don't restart another war, plus the fact that their fame helped to bring in clients that kept this village afloat with funding. For one who was dubbed by the monikers the god of shinobi, and the professor he didn't know what to do. I'm getting too old for this shit, he sighed. Suddenly there was a sharp knock at the door. Oh great. Just what I needed. A distraction, he muttered before loudly announcing for the visitor to enter. The door opened to reveal one of his anger captains. He was characterized by gravity-defying gray hair, a mask that may have been a part of his shirt, that extended from behind his flak vest to the bridge of his nose. The description was complete with a leaf eight that covered his left eye. People could only wonder what Kakashi had it got off by hiding at least 75% of his face. He'd probably lie if they asked anyway. Kakashi-san, what can I do for you? Sirotobi welcomed me. Is it true that Sensei has died, Hokage-sama? Kakashi asked, getting straight to the point. 
He could see the answer written plainly on the Hokage's face, but still waited for the elder man's response. Harazan frowned at the forward question, and gave the man the affirmative, and Kakashi pressed on, as he pointed at the baby in the basket. And this child is his son. Harazan's face fell even more, if that much was possible. He didn't know how Kakashi came to know so quickly. Perhaps all those who knew or could come to that conclusion could be counted on a single hand. Kakashi, and he included of course. Yes. The copy ninja sighed, as he silently grieved. He knew, as much, having been charged by Minato-sensei himself to guard his wife Kashina, while she was in the early stages of her pregnancy till two weeks short of the end of it. Well he knew that he, Minato, died in sacrifice to save the village, and would not want anyone to cry for him, he couldn't help, but shed a few tears from his exposed eye. So what are you going to do, Hokage-sama? Figuring out a funeral, reasoning out the budget to fix the village, and to top it all off, I'm pondering what to say, and what not to say to that damned council. Frankly, that's the easy part. Excuse me. The Hokage looked at him in shock. Everything except his heritage. After all, we can't handle any threats by any villages that have Minato-sensei's enemies affiliated with them. They both started with an uncanny simultaneous effect. They both stared at each other for well over a minute. Then what about the... Minato-sensei told us that he wanted him to be seen as a hero. How did you? I was beside you when his clone told you. Hirazan started to fervently hope he wasn't going senile. Perhaps it was due to the stress of the situation. Yes, that had to be it. Despite the bleak situation, the older of the two men managed to crack a smile. You know, you should take this ad. Meh, don't feel like it. They both started to chuckle, but they stopped when they heard a giggle. They looked around, but then they heard it again coming from the basket. As they looked at the baby inhabitant who was giggling, as it clutched a cheap-looking necklace that the copycat ninja recognized as Kashinas. The necklace was merely a string running through a small wooden necklace with the words Yuzu on one side, and a red and white swirl on the other. The child giggled again, and the previously crestfallen Hokage couldn't help but smile wider. He couldn't help but think that things might get better after all. The third fire shadow sighed as he stepped into the meeting chamber. It was going to be a long day. Looks like he was wrong about things getting better. Not that it started out peachy anyway. The councilmen and women of the shinobi and civilian factions had all gathered. All those who had survived the previous night anyway. The particularly nasty thought ran through his head, as he thought about Mibuki Haruno he briefly entertained the notion that she might have perished during the Kyubi's rampage, but all hopes fled when he saw the woman's stoic face from behind a council man's head, when said man shifted in his seat. Sir Toby could only think that a beast in great want of destruction, had literally misset certain people who would not be missed, least of all himself. Did the damn creature actually kill the rest of the likable people in the village? Sir Toby took his seat, and waited patiently for everyone to settle, or rather stall it for his migraine began. Finally coming to a more or less agreeable degree of silence, Hirazan called for a complete version of it in a less than agreeable fashion, although his aura helped make it far more persuasive. Quite. He bellowed, leaking just enough killing intent to scare the muttering civilians, and ninja-like. Seeing them all visibly straightened, he nodded with approval, now that we are settled, what's first on the agenda? Peace was once again forfeit in the chaotic shouts, each person trying to speak louder than the other, except for the clan heads who calmly raised their hands. Hiyashi-san. Here is an acknowledged. What about Kiyubi? We all know that the fourth went to intercept it, but after a short period of time it disappeared. We wish to know what had transpired, the Haika said, or almost demanded, as it were. His expressionless face was unreadable, yet Hiruzen noted that there was a hint of worry etched into the man's brows. The Sandam gazed at the expressionless Hiyashi, and gave a sigh. Everyone leaned closer, as if a few inches increased their hearing capabilities. The Hokage began to speak. As you all know, the Bijka are beings that cannot be harmed without massive effort from the offender. Also, even if they are killed they would reform in a few years, due to the fact that they are merely creatures compassed of nothing, but chakra. So instead, Saratobi beckoned to a maid holding something swaddled in a lilac-colored blanket. He couldn't take the risk of it attacking again in a few years, so he did the best next thing. By now the maid had now reached his side, and Sarah Toby took the bundle from her, as people strained to see what was inside the blanket. For a fleeting moment, he wondered if he was about to make the stupidest mistake of his life again. He sacrificed, and sealed it away in a newborn using the Shaikifkin, Reaper Death Seal, a forbidden technique, which demands your soul forfeit. He forged the strongest seal ever created with the Shinigami's help in the hopes that you all would see the child, as a hero for having to live with this burden, Kanahagakur no Sato, village hidden in the leaves, hears and proclaimed, lifting the child. She was saved by her youngest son. There was an ungodly amount of silence for a minute. On everyone's faces there was the unmistakable look of realization. Hirazan, for a moment, had thought he had broken through to them. Yes, perhaps they would take what he said to heart. He'd heard of instances where the Jinchkriki were respected, and liked, like Kumagakur. But his hopes were dashed when he heard what was shouted next. 
they had come to realize that the boy was a demon in disguise. It was to be expected. They were ignorant of the powers of Kenjutsu. After all, how would one go about imprisoning a demon the size of a damn mountain inside a boar? He'd especially had hopes of the shinobi faction of being more educated on matters related to this, but was instead disappointed when they deferred to making the same shouts as the civilians. Whether it was mob mentality or just plain pent-up hatred, Hiruzen didn't know. Kill the demon. What the hell? The damn beast is still alive. Kill it now, Lord Third. My family died to that beast, and the fourth left it alive. Those were just a few of those of the civilian faction. All of them were hysterical. Kinjutsu was a strange art, yes, but weren't the powers of all ninjas strange to the civilians? Granted, at first it did sound far-fetched for paper with ink scribbles to explode, but so was breathing fire, calling creatures from other realms, pulling bones from your body to fight with, and seeing through walls. Albeit the shinobi present have to be able to suppress personal emotions. Not completely, but to a tolerable amount. Also, all of them had to various degrees in knowledge of the sealing arts, and that it had virtually unlimited potential. But it was hard to grasp that it was still alive. They also called for its death, although they were trying to use logic in their speech. We should kill it now or third. The fourth sacrificed his life to make the Kyubi vulnerable. After all, what is weaker than a baby? With all due respect to Hokage-sama, the child must be killed to destroy this threat. And so it went. On one hand, they were more respectful of his authority. But on the other hand, the message was still the same. The third was saddened. To think that no one would recognize this child for who he is, a hero. But then again, heroes were seldom loved in their own country. And Anbu quietly, and slowly reached for his ten. To anyone who would be watching, they would assume that he was prepared to act as crowd control, in case anyone decided to become physically offensive. His right hand finally completed its 30 second journey to its destination, and gripped the handle of his weapon, akin to a hungry predator on his prey that refused to let go. He then reached for his cyanide and nightshade pill, and held it in between his molars. He then focused a minuscule amount of chakra that could hardly be sensed into his 30 second delayed A grade explosive tag, and started to remember his wife. Their father had never liked him, but despite the fact that his denial of their relationship, the two lovers had been set to elope on the 12th of October. He could easily recall her vivaciousness, it was one of her many qualities that he had found attractive. She was all over the place, writing this, trying on this, putting on that, going here, and they're mad with preparations. He was passionately in love with her, and her with him. He was sure that after marriage he would quit being an Anbu, and slow down. Go on missions only once in a while, and do mostly routine village guard duty. As tears started to drip freely from the inside of the mask on his face to the ground, he realized that the day he yearned for, that being the 12th of October was no longer real. No longer within his reach. It wasn't coming tomorrow. 20 seconds. He thought of the corpse of his fiancée he had seen half buried under the rubble of their would-be shared home, the place they would have raised their family. Even so, in that tragic moment, he had to leave to fight a murderer, who had moved on to destroy another area of the village. But he had failed. He couldn't even get close to the monster. It had all been for naught. No he firmly thought. It wasn't that it wasn't within reach. For him, there was no tomorrow. But he will join her today. 17, 16, 15. He dashed forward at the Hokage, who was currently holding the child in his arms. 14. The Hokage was caught unawares, but his reflexes saved him, and the baby, as he withdrew a kunai from under his robes, but quickly parried the tent with the kunai in a reverse grip. 13, 12, 11. The god of shinobi channeled chakra into his blade, and cut the tent in two, and the offending Anbu leapt back from the Hokage, sliding back in a prepared running man stance, already starting to charge a Suratobi once more. The other Anbus watching the fight were surprised at first, but got over it, as they hurled multiple kunai, and shuriken at the offender that struck, and embedded themselves in his flesh, particularly his heart, lungs, and stomach. His sprint slowed to a run, then to limp, then to a paint crawl still moving towards the old man holding the bane of his existence. The killer of the love of his life. Holding the baby, as if it was innocent. 10, 9, 8. Halfway there. His final position was settling into a prostrate form in front of the sanding, kunai, and shuriken sticking out of him everywhere, making him resemble a human porcupine. The weapons also made the man bleed out to some extent, but not enough to kill him in the next few seconds. Kirizan noticed something akin to water at the bottom of the Anbu's mask. Saliva. Tears maybe. 7, 6, 5. The Anbu groaned in pain. Wouldn't be long, he grunted to the Hokage. Why would he say that? The Hokage thought. Probably because he's dying. But there was some satisfaction in it, even though he failed to kill me. Was he a spy? Assassin perhaps? Kami, just what I needed some no-name assassin at a time like this it was then with stark alarm, that the Hokage noticed the bomb tag half out of the Anbu's bomb pouch, with a slight glow around the kanji for ignite, and who knew how many more passive ones waiting to be detonated. Of course. 4. Explosive tag. Run. Sirotobi bellowed. 
He quickly looked around and saw everyone fleeing and noticed that Anvis were performing the Shinshino body flicker technique with the slower civilians. In the heat of the moment, he grabbed Humur with his right hand and used a seal less Shunshin outside. 3. The Hokage suddenly appeared outside and released Humur, who promptly proceeded to dry heave. It had been a while since he himself had been there done a Shunshin. Moving at high speeds at short ranges with drastic changes in scenery, does that to the inexperienced or infirm at times when it seemed as if they were teleporting. 2. Will you be alright? Here's an asked hastily to the man who was on his knees who appeared as if he was about to cough up a lung. I will be fine, he answered between coughs. But where is Kaher? Kaher. 1. You must go back for her. Take the boy. As Siratobi was about to hand over the child to Hamur, the council room exploded in shattered glass and scattered flying debris. His face became crestfallen in worry for his former teammate and hoped that no one, including her, got caught in the blast. He watched the Anbu perform a sorted suitin, water release, techniques pulled from walls using water manipulation or water made with pure chakra. Knowing his duties as Hokage, he proceeded to do the same. Time skip. Kahair lay on the bed, having been dosed heavily on anesthesia. She had yet to become more aware of her surroundings, as well as her immediate situation. But here isn't at her bedside new. And his insights were in turmoil of what it was. He was consumed by if. If only I had intervened more quickly. If only I had screened Anbu with personal tragic losses. If only I had given the child to Hamer, then grabbed both him and Kahair, all would have been saved. And so on. Here is inside. He knew that the past was past, and what was done was done. But he knew when Kahair woke up, probably in the morning, she would not be pleased, especially given their rising animosity in the recent years concerning Ido's exile. Her son was gone. Who would explain it to her? No one liked to be the bearer of bad news. Would Humer, their other former teammate do it? No. Knowing him, he would come perhaps three hours after she was told. Makes it easier to deal with the after emotions, as well as being a bit distant from it to separate himself from the problem, should it become worse. Let a doctor do it. They were used to giving bad news after all. He would simply come with Hamur later. Much later. What a shitty week. It was a warm day in November in Kanahagakur. Just a typical day filled with birds singing, people socializing with each other through games like Shungai, eating contests or just relaxing. The village's children played with each other in the less busy streets and in playgrounds, their cheery laughter giving mirth to the adults who looked on at them. To top it off, a pleasant wind was blowing keeping everyone cool. All in all, it was a very pleasant day, not to mention the fact there was even a festival planned for later. Everyone was happy, save for one. A six-year-old boy sat on his butt hugging his knees in the shade of a large tree crying. He was upset because of unfairness. His spiky sun-blessed hair was dirty and unkempt that dropped a bit over his crying cerulean eyes. His whiskers that exaggerated his emotions when smiling, grinning or frowning, served to single him out from the crowd and ostracized him wherever he went. He was wearing a black t-shirt with a pair of small shorts complete with shinobi sandals. All Naruto Uzumaki had wanted was a turn on the swing in the playground. He didn't go for someone who just went on. He just went to a girl who had been swinging for a good 15 minutes. After all, give someone else a chance, no. The girl just looked at him and threw a begging fit to stay on a little longer, and her outlandish behavior tagged her as a very spoiled little girl. What she couldn't beg for, she cried for. When that didn't work, she screamed. Naruto, trying to defuse her, told her that he could wait a little more. Sure. He said with a high wedded smile. Pleased with her victory, she stayed on the swing for another 10 minutes before he asked again. You crying? This attracted her father's attention who was conversing with his wife on a nearby bench. He looked over to see the bane of Kanoha with his precious angel, and she was crying. In all honesty, even Naruto at his age knew that the developing situation didn't look good. Boy, demon brat. Get away from my little girl, you. He shouted, already looking for a stick of rock or something to punctuate his sentence with on the boy's person. He finally found a rather large branch and rushed at the boy, determined to defend his daughter. Before he could hit the boy however, two members of the Kanoha police force, clad in their typical robes complete with their clan crest, a red and white fan, appeared out of thin air, grabbed him by the wrists and shoulders, and then all three disappeared. About 10 seconds later one returned and started to escort Naruto away from the scene, he was already familiar with how they operated, and just let them handle him however they wanted. The man's wife however, let Naruto know how she felt about the whole situation. You damn demon. Look at the trouble you've caused. First you pester my child, get my husband arrested. What next? Are you going to get me killed next? Why don't you just die, and let us live in peace? This, this spawn of the Kai. That was, as far as she got in her rant, as another operative of said force appeared behind her, and landed a cuff on the nape of neck, driving it upwards to the backside of her skull, effectively knocking her out. He then proceeded to grab the still crying girl, and then disappeared with the two females in a swirl of leaves. 
the remaining patrons of the playground didn't dare do anything, while Naruto was escorted away by the first. Nothing that could get them into trouble anyway. Glaring, and upset whispering was not punishable by law. The miserable boy, no longer able to rein in his emotions, burst into tears, and ran away from his handler into the woods. The Chiha, deciding to give him some space, proceeded to Shunshin away to return to patrolling. The boy pumped his short legs, as fast as they could carry him. He had no real destination. It could be anywhere, so long, as he could get away from the cold glares, angry murmurs, and unfairness. The boy was about to pass a large tree under which he tripped on one of its great protruding roots at his top speed. All it served to do was to bring him to a complete stop from his adrenaline-enhanced run physical pain compounded on his emotional one. He crawled over to the tree, and started hugging his knees, still crying. The immense pain in his ankles started to dull, and then fade altogether. The boy, however, continued to cry for another 5 minutes, after which he laid on his side still hugging his knees. The ankle was sprained only for a few minutes. Looking up at the tree, he was lulled to sleep by its gently swinging branches in a hypnotic rhythmic pattern. It felt lovely. He then fell asleep. Time skip. It sounds very promising. Furthermore, it stands to benefit both of our nations, Korsan, Hiruzen stated after the discussion. Without a doubt, Hokage Dono, the ambassador replied. In addition to sharing trade routes, we will be able to open new ones, greatly increasing the financial assets of our respective villages. We also stand to gain militaristic clout when we assist each other in conflict. Excellent. The Hokage beamed, the council won't need long to deliver this. It doesn't warrant much to ponder over seeing that the answer is, as plain, as black, and white. In the meantime, I trust that you will find your accommodations to your liking. You shall be able to stay, as long as you wish, Sirotobi went on, a bit eager to please. The Kyubi attack six years ago had put a seemingly bottomless hole in the treasury, that desperately needed filling hence the reason the Hokage wanted this treaty to go through. It was more or less ass kissing, not that he would admit it to anyone. Much obliged, Hokage Dono. I certainly shall. At a discreet signal, two of his masked ambus appeared. Anbu, please show our guests to their accommodations for the night. As the Kumonins left to be escorted to their hotel, the elderly Hokage smiled. This was his first true smile in six years. Finally, things were going to get better for the Hidden Leaf, they badly needed a win. Yet, somehow, it felt off. Like it was too good to be true. He hoped he was wrong. Time skip. It looks to me that the wreckage was right. We made him an offer he just couldn't refuse, and it really shows that they're desperate for the money to rebuild. The damn tree huggers. Korjin Soku was pleased. While he knew he was on a potentially suicide mission with his guards Kiji and Aizu, he knew that his death would consolidate more power to his home, the village hidden in the clouds. What are the next steps, Kor? Aizu quietly asked. His patience wearing thin, Kor nearly yelled. Speak up man. Damn, I'm tired of always having to read your lips to know what you and Kiji are saying. You know it is in our nature to be born of the Sorrento clan, Aizu quietly stated, completely nonplussed by his cohort's exclamation. Well, at least you're not as bad as Kiji. Barely says five words in a whole fucking year. Anyway, we all know what to do. Both of you will get into the Haika clan compound and retrieve the heirs. They should all be focused on Lady Hitomi having contractions. Kiji, do you have the concentrated time essence? Kiji gave a small nod. But Kiji dropping the time essence in her tea, or even releasing it in the air in her room, should cause her to have premature contractions. While everyone is fussing over her, we will acquire the heiress in the confusion. Having these Hokaya clan members will further help this endeavor, considering they don't have chakra coils, but instead purely manipulating yin and yang release to use stealth techniques. They should be theoretically in the subletto the Byakugan. Then Aizu will fetch me the girl, and I'll use my swift release to get back to Kumo, leaving behind a clone with my cohorts to ensure we are not suspected, leaving at the time we told the Hokage. We will have the Byakugan, and Kanohan none the wiser until it's well too late. We're heading out one hour after the festival starts. People not drunk by then will be halfway drunk, as well as almost all the shinobi off duty. That's our best time. Both of you shall approach the compound from the southeast forest. According to our intel, that area is the least guarded. Going with logic, should be even more so because of the festival tonight. Is that understood? Yes, Aizu affirmed, with Kiji nodding in his response. Very well. Lady Hitomi is having contractions. W what? It's two months too early. Unusual, yes. But we have to get her to the medical wing. Hi. Time skip. Ha, hey, went off without a hitch. Once I've crossed the border, Kumo will win. Kor muttered. Kiji and Aizu will have gotten back to the hotel with my clone, looking reserved by morning, as if we don't know anything. As if. He laughed. He adjusted the drug girl more comfortably for running before channeling even more of his innate swift release, and took off even faster, practically faster than a blink. So fast that he noticed it too late. A stick of some sort had caught him in the face, right in the nose, and broke it. Erg. 
the child flew from his arms into the air. Even in his pained state, he saw the child flying into the air, and he panicked. He didn't progress this far in the plan, and just failed because he ran too fast to notice a stick in his way. A stick. He followed through with that train of thought, as he got up, and ran towards the spot he predicted the child would fall, seeing its general trajectory. A stick from one of these local trees should be supple, scratching my face, as it bent, not flat out striking me, as if it were, as inert, as a thick branch or something artificial, and man-made, like metal. Here his thought came to an abrupt halt, as he saw the child disappear at the apex of its journey in the air, apparently due to someone, or something's intervention. What? Who's there? He hissed in confusion, looking around wildly. Over here. He turned to the source of the voice animatedly, only to see a man sitting on a tree stump holding the toddler against their chest. Kor, getting upset, charged at the stranger with his swift release, but at the last second, his fist to hit a purple barrier of sorts. He drew back his fist, and lunged with a kunai, only for it to be harmlessly repelled to the side, the barrier only appearing when external contact reached within a few feet of the man. Hey asshole, you mind not doing that. You might wake up the girl. He looked down at the girl, wondering how she hadn't awoken yet. Oh. She's drugged. Kor tried to attack the man again, with each attempt ending in failure in everything, but serving to get himself angry, and frustrated. With his anger reaching its peak, he resorted to, almost uncaring if he hurt or killed the Heikgeers. Jabashi lightning release. Electromagnetic murder. Electricity flashed in deadly arcs from the Kumo ninja's hands to the man, and surrounding area. Seeing the man still unharmed, he laced in three times the amount of chakra needed for the, for it to finally end in an explosion around the stranger. As the smoke cleared, Kor looked forward to seeing the man electrocuted, and burned, but was instead treated to the sight of scorched grass, and ground in a perfect circle around him. Are you done yet? Another voice, but similar, sounded behind Kor to see an identical replica of a stranger standing 30 feet away from him. Shit. The clone. For the first time, Kor studied the man. He was dressed in a jet black trench coat with a hut over his head. His look was completed with a holster with a small stick in it 4 inches long, as well as shinobi sandals. Wait sick. Could that be the weapon that struck me? But it's too small. You want that barrier down, huh? Just call me, and that'll release the barrier, and disperse. How about it? The stranger said. He spoke in a deadpan voice, but ridicule was salted into it. It was obvious that he certainly didn't expect the Kumonin to be able to beat him. Who are you? The stranger shrugged. Name's Ido, he said easily enough, as if he didn't really care much either way. Kor paused for a moment to figure out if he could remember the name, but couldn't. Just give me the girl. Not, as if she's your daughter or some shit like that. You don't know her. I know of her. Are you gonna try to take her back, or are you gonna walk? Ido sounded as if he really didn't care much either way. He'd actually want the man to stay, he had something that he wanted. At that, Kor took out his kunai, and held it in a forward grip, studying the black clad man's stance or lack thereof. You gonna make a move? Kor taunted. Can you fight? The stranger replied back. More mind games Kor gritted his teeth. Die. Kor ran at the man at full speed, channeling swift release. With speed like his, the man will be dead inside a second. Just, as he lunged with his kunai, one inch before striking the man's chest, the stranger grabbed his knife arm at the wrist with his left arm, and jabbed his right arm through Kor's armpit, sidestepped, and planted the palm of his hand against the back of Kor's head. He then slammed Kor's head right onto the hard ground, effectively knocking him out. Pathetic. With the man taken care of, Ido turned back to regard his clone that held the child. So you gonna tell me why you look like me, you damn nine tails. The man who held Hinata gave off a standoffish vibe, yet still on guard. You've never changed your wardrobe, and it's better to look like a crook than a beast running amok through the village, am I right? I came because I sense a brain-sucking bastard hanging around. Better I take after you when I'm prepared. Though? Ido was now more than just merely concerned, as he prepared to decapitate the unconscious swift release user. So you gonna fight me? Why the fuck are you here? The disguised nine tails demanded. Where is she? The servant involuntarily shivered under her master's gaze, desperately trying to muster up the will just to speak clearly. We don't know, Hiyashi-sama, we have already searched the whole compound, the festival, the whole village. She is nowhere to be found. Hiyashi was angry no, he was downright furious. Some third party had to be involved. There was no way a four, on the verge of five, year old could be able to escape detection from the all-seeing Byakugan. But who? He couldn't call anyone to mind. If the child was really outside the village, there had to be foul play afoot. He couldn't call to mind anyone who would do this to him or his daughter, not anyone alive or locked up anyway. But even if they could have been there, they had no means of being able to sneak into a compound filled with people able to see through walls, kidnap his daughter, and sneak her out of a shinobi-dominated village, without the tiniest bit of suspicion. But what happened had happened, and there was no undoing it. They had to pick up the pieces, release some hacked guards because of incompetence, and find his daughter. 
All right, that's enough Kaya, he actually said in a huff to the nervous branch member, as he made up his mind on his next option. Return to your duties. Hearing this, the frazzled branch woman was relieved, as she had thought that she would have been punished for bringing bad news. While Hiyashi did not practice using the caged bird seal, like other main branch members, particularly the elders, he was unpredictable at times of great adversity, and this was certainly one of those times. He wasn't generally unkind, but he did look especially in the mood to be. Time skip. I am here to see the Hokage. His gnarly stern and flat tone, and was marred with worry and anger, and likewise was his face. She allowed him to go upstairs, and informed him to knock on the Hokage's door once there, and he did so with markedly more hurry than she'd ever seen a Haike in. Come in, the muffled voice from behind the door said. Hiyashi turned the knob, and pushed it open to find the Hokage dressed up in a simple blue kimono. Apparently, the man was just about ready to leave himself to attend the festival. Hokage-sama, a moment of your time. I have an important request. You just caught me, Hiyashi, the wise and Hokage said coolly, though his mentality was rapidly settling into crisis mode. By all means, Hiyashi-san. What is it? The old Hokage inquired. My daughter's missing. I wish for you to locate my daughter, Hinata, so I may know her whereabouts, the slightly frowning Haika replied bluntly. But isn't this a clan problem? Even more so, this should pose no problem for the Haikas. That is the problem, Sir Tobi sama We cannot locate her within the village walls, or not. Isayashi hesitated, trying to choose his next word, disconcerting. Well, this suddenly went from bizarre to upsetting. This is serious. It was an easy assumption that Hiyashi wanted him to use the crystal ball to find his daughter, it made more sense than mobilizing a couple dozen ninjas. Without the prompt being spoken, the Hokage got out the crystal ball, and started the technique. Soon, an image of two men appeared, one of which held Hinata against his chest, while the other held a man over his shoulder. The unconscious man on the shoulder was recognized as the ambassador he was speaking with earlier. Hiyashi, and the Hokage saw the one with Hinata about to knock at the door, that the two black clothed men stood in front of. However, the man with Hinata hesitated, and seemed to argue with the other before then poisoning to knock. Where is that? Hiyashi asked. It seems familiar is at our door. Both Haikda and Suratobi froze. At the same time with the image of the man knocking at the door, they heard a knock at their door. Both Hiyashi and Harrison shared an uneasy look, and the Haikda nodded to him, as if saying to let him in, not as an order request, but as a plea. The elderly Hokage then flared his chakra twice to tell the hiding Anbu in the room of a potential threat, before he welcomed the men inside, as clearly as he could manage. Come in. The door pushed in to let the two men in, along with their human baggage, but the one who carried Hinata entered in the lead. Hiruzen took in their description thoroughly. Wearing a black trench coat not unlike a bikis, with black full-length pants along with black shinobi sandals, some sort of kanji he couldn't see clearly. He also wore gloves that exposed the tips of his fingers with protective metal plates on the back of the wrist. The man's head was covered by a head that was complemented by a face mask that came up to the bridge of the man's nose, and his eyes were shadowed by the head of his clothes. Both men were similar in appearance, leading the Hokage to believe that one of them was a clone of the other. Who are you? Hiyashi asked the hooded man tensely, bordering on the edge of threatening. The man, either not noticing the tone, or ignoring it, replied in an even tone. Just a hungry man passing through. I was looking for something to eat when I saw this guy, and decided that you know he tried to think of a lie, if only for Kyuubi's sake, to intervene. He didn't mention his own name either. Just a mere mention of it would draw every single Anbu in the area to try to kill him. Furthermore, given by how vague he was, everyone realized that he didn't care to tell them his name, and chose to ignore that fact. Explain yourself. We wish to know what transpired. The Hokage requested, now calming, to see the mysterious man is no longer a threat, not now anyway. His Anbu were still on standby, but he didn't tell them to stand down. He himself wasn't relaxing either, and he was sure that Hiyashi was the same. Simple. This, your daughter, he gestured to the sleeping girl. Was kidnapped by this man, he nodded at the still unconscious man. And I stopped him before he reached the border. Judging by what he said, Kamagakur was just after the Byakugan. Here's an interlocked his fingers in interest. Could you describe what happened? We stopped him, that's all you need to know, the clone said, speaking for the first time. The clone then handed the sleeping girl to her father, who cradled her to his chest relieved. Then I challenged him, the original continued with mild gusto, suggesting that he was a prideful person, he ran at me, and I knocked him out. That's it. Oh, so he was exhausted, so I took it. He actually asked. No. Just weak, or at least to me. He only used one B-rank technique, and was a user of swift release. Both Yashis and the Hokage's eyes widened at this relation, though the latter didn't allow his surprise to show, as much, as the former. Knowing of the incredible speeds that came with this release, as well as the added perks that came with having a, plus the fact that it was a certainty that the ambassador was a skilled shinobi. The man before them was powerful. Period. Seeing as you intervened in our favor, I take it you're affiliated with Kanoha then. 
The Hokage asked almost rhetorically, trying to look for anything that could tell him who he was. Or was. The stranger stroked his chin in mock thought. No. Ain't got no allegiance, especially to this village. To be honest, it's my least favorite. The missing Ninhyashi was alarmed. His Byakugan activated, ready to act. Also on their own way of thinking, before Hiruzen could cue them otherwise, the Anvis in the room leapt from hiding, and attempted to incapacitate the strange man. Attempted to. A magenta-colored barrier appeared in front of the clone, and the unmoving man that electrocuted the two Anvis into unconsciousness. The men looked down at the Anubis briefly before back at the Haka and Cage. Kanoha is such a grateful village, the clone said sarcastically. You know, maybe I should have helped. After all, they appreciate guys like me up there. I'm just a good hack. He laughed for a moment, wondering if he even believed the words that were coming out of his mouth. Fire shadow, rain in your animals. I can still sense that they don't like me much. At ease. At the Hokage's order everyone relaxed. He actually stared at the man for a few seconds more with his Byakugan active before deactivating it. But then why help us? I want to know why. You don't know us, work for us or even against Kumo. You had no reason to. Hiyashi said, trying to get over the fact that the man disabled two Anbu without even moving. Among his many other off-putting characteristics. The clone cocked his head in apparent curiosity. So you prefer I assist Kumo, I take it. No? Hiyashi almost outright exclaimed, however, I am grateful to you sir. You have my gratitude for returning my daughter, gratitude, and well wishes. If there's anything I can do to repay you. Careful. The man said surely, or I might have to take you up on that. Would you like to work for Kanoha? The Hokage asked, wanting to have such a powerful ninja in his ranks. Or at least have a friend instead of an enemy. Damn, old man, weren't you listening? I don't like Kanoha. He made a show of shrugging his shoulders, trying to get it across that he didn't wish to rebuff the man, only to refuse his offer. So no thanks. In any case, take the man. The stranger dropped the ambassador, as if he was nothing more than garbage, and yet unwillingly, and started to turn to leave. The clone had already left, no one was sure when. I hope you'll never need my help again, cause I'm not a huge fan of helping. But about what you said about being grateful to me, I dig that, I think I'll take a favor later on if I need it. Fire Shadow Haika he nodded to both men in farewell, but for some reason, it was somewhat impolite when he did it to the cage. The original stepped backwards to his shadow in a corner of the room, and was gone. I don't sense him. Hiyashi. Hiruzen whispered. At the prompt, Hiyashi walked to the corner, and felt it, and his hand came away with nothing. Why didn't you use your Byakugan? The age cage asked. Remember when I had my Byakugan activated earlier? Yes, of course. When I looked at him with it, he vanished. I could only see him without it. The Hokage was baffled. That is unheard of. Who is that man? The lone boy slowly returned to the waking world he had left some time before. He wiped away the matter encrusted at the edges of his blue eyes with his sensitive hands. It felt as if they were being punctured with pins and needles, he must have fallen asleep on them, and cut off the blood flow to an extent. He sat up, trying to get his bearings before remembering, and mournfully contemplating the events of what had happened to him at the playground. The mean looks, the lady, and what she had said something about him being the spawn of the nine. Nine something. He didn't know because the woman didn't get to finish her sentence. What did she mean? I'll just ask Shiji. I bet he knows all the stuff in the world. He thought with ending finality. So long as the man didn't somehow distract him from his questions like he sometimes did, Naruto felt that he should be fine. When he had gone to sleep, it was after midday. He didn't have enough discernment to realize that the shadows currently were being made by an eastern sun, almost directly overhead. He looked up at the tree, and smiled. He felt fully rested he'd had a really good nap. What he failed to realize. He had lost a full day while he was asleep. He ran home, and his cheaply made red and white necklace glowed a faint white. Deep inside, the Kyubi grimaced to itself, wondering how he was going to explain to his container that he was in trouble. Nay, perhaps later when the boy was older and sensible. Much later. Time skip. The lavender-eyed girl woke up and gave a small yawn. As her lavender eyes adjusted to the bright light streaming through her window, she suddenly noticed that her mother was sitting on the opposite side of the bed, smiling at her. Good morning Hinata-chan, she said happily. The young girl hadn't even fully awoken yet, and was barely able to return the courtesy, leading the mother to believe that she was drugged, and some of it was still in the girl's system. How are you feeling? I still feel very tired, Akasan. As if I haven't slept at all. That only served to affirm her suspicions. Hitomi decided to let her daughter return to sleep, hoping that she could perhaps sleep it off the rest. Very well, Hinata-chan. You may go back to bed. You don't have to go to your private lessons today. However, you will speak to your father when he calls for you, is that alright? He wants to speak to you about last night. Hi. I love you, my. Hinata blinked stupidly before letting her eyes close with a small smile, gracing her bonny face. I love you too, Akasan. With that, Hitomi left the room. 
by herself now, Hinata thought it was strange that her lessons were not to be taken today. She had them every day for an hour, beginning promptly at dawn. They were unavoidable, except on special days of celebration in the village or her birthday. So why was she being allowed to return to sleep? She allowed the question to niggle her mind for a bit before ignoring it. With her head on the pillow, and the pull of slumber almost already too strong, she was close to getting knocked out with sleep. Absent-mindedly, her last hollow thought was that she felt she could recall something, animal-like, trying to protect her from something. And a lot of arguing. Didn't this happen last night? Wait didn't her father want to talk to her about last night? She fell asleep. Time skip. The kettle whistled its special call, but Kahara groaned. While she wanted the tea inside she wished she had the energy to get up and get it, but she had just settled down in her most comfortable bed, with a new book that promised intrigue with mystery. The kettle called for another minute before she gave up with a sigh, and dangled her lower torso off the bed. But she lost her balance, and landed on her butt. Kuzo. Still struggling to use her weary muscles and aged bones, she pulled herself up using the bed frame as support. Finally rising, she hobbled to the corner on one leg and grabbed her crutches. Six years of being a post-amputee, and she hasn't grown used to it. She had only grown more surly, taciturn, and bitter. It hadn't gotten any easier. Instead, it had grown more and more difficult in her advancing age. As it had grown bothersome to cope with doing normal and simple everyday activities like walking or dancing, she used to enjoy doing so much. Not to mention the new hurdles like stairs. Just another reminder why she moved from her third floor apartment to one on the ground floor. Making it to her kitchen, she leaned one of her crutches against her kitchen table, and leaned on the other, bracing on it, and turned off the flame. She then poured the hot beverage into a cup, and set it down, and not a moment too soon. Phantom pain had set in on her amputated left leg, making her grit her teeth. Her cut nerves still registered pain below her knee when it was no longer there. Kami, why me? What have I done to deserve this? I can't help, but feel it's the brat's fault. If it hadn't been for him, the Anbu wouldn't have bombed the council building. It was a weak accusation, and she knew it. But she needed someone to blame. Tears streamed down her face, as she wished for relief from the pain. Both physical and emotional. Benito, my son. Where is he? I don't even know if he's still alive, what with here isn't keeping him from me with his damn exile. Doesn't he even care? There were a lot of things. A crook, maybe. Too determined and ambitious for his own good. Definitely greedy and strong too. Hell, he was even one of the nominations for Yandame in competition along with Arachimaru and Minato. But he was never around, especially in times like this when she missed him and wanted to see him. Where was he? Naruto fidgeted uncomfortably in his seat before letting his head hit the desk, as he suffered through his teachers, or sensei, as Iruka's ego would prefer, boring lecture, not wanting to look through the window anymore. Bemoaning the loss of what looked like a day perfect to be anywhere else doing anything else, he allowed the sound of the man's teachings to break down into a background monotone. Winding down in his ministrations to his class, Yumino Aruka smiled, as he thought of all the young minds he was passing down his knowledge to. And that's why Ninja Wire is so strong. He trailed off when he saw a spiky mop of bright blonde hair close no, far too close to the desk, indicating that the owner had his hat down again for the third time that morning. Naruto. Wake up. Aruka shouted, stopping right in the middle of his lecture to chuck his eraser at the seemingly asleep Uzumaki, just to let him know just how much he appreciated the boy napping in his class. I wasn't sleeping. Naruto shouted while lifting his head. Depending on the varied opinion of whether it was fortunate or not, when he rose up, the eraser clocked him squarely between his eyes. Ah. Serves you right. If you were paying attention, you wouldn't have gotten hit. Say for a very select few, the whole class erupted in a laughing riot. There were the usual jeers and teases that were duly expected from a class of children, be it that they were ninjas in training or not, but one comment in particular stood out to him, that remark coming from the pretty girl he liked with the pink hair. Fair. Sasuke Khan would have dodged like a pro. What, Sakura chan? I didn't have time to dodge. She stomped over to him and gave him her rebuttal, that being in the form of four knuckles drilled into his head. Quiet. Naruto Baka. Needless to say, he now had a large bump to match with the welt on his face. Bye Tai. Alright, cut it out everyone. Iruka demanded, trying to restore order to his class, more or less successful after a bit, he refocused his attention on the Uzumaki. Naruto, sorry for thinking you were asleep, but you need to keep your head up and pay attention. You know that you're not exactly the fastest, so you need to put in more effort to learn. Okay. Naruto grumbled something about already knowing the subject matter that the man was teaching, but was only not able to remember it. Deciding that he'd lost because of this facet, he tried to look apologetic despite being irritated. Hi, Iruka-sensei. Now throw me back the eraser. Feeling that the man needed a bit of commupance, Naruto reached under his desk where he kept a small stockpile of prank items hidden, and withdrew something that was certainly not an eraser. Here you go. Catch. Iruka stared wide-eyed to see a large all-balloon coming at him, that seemed to have suspicious contents coming at him. 
Before the balloon filled with pink paint even made contact, Naruto had already beaten a hasty retreat out the window. Iruka's yell of surprise was cut off, and was soon followed by one of indignation. Pink paint. Naruto. I'm gonna get you for this. Iruka yelled, exasperated, as he tried to smear some of the paint off of his face with an equally paint-ridden form. The class stared at him, not knowing whether to poke fun at him at the risk of incurring the man's wrath, although Ino soon made a deliberate observation. Iruka's all pink. It's such an awful color. That's my hair color Ino pig. Billboard brow. The two girls stomped over each other, insulted each other some more, which led to a calf fight over Sasuke's love life. As Iruka looked on, still covered in pink paint, he did the only thing he could to salvage some esteem in his students' eyes, and give himself a chance to leave under the impression that he wasn't completely upset. Class, break for lunch. Immediately, the class rushed past him through the door outside, and when the room was empty except for himself standing in a pink puddle, he wondered if it was Naruto's specialty to make a class go from order to chaos. Deciding to leave him be for the rest of the day, he went to tell Mizuki to take over the afternoon class, while he got himself cleaned up. Time skip. Damn, I nailed him with that one he didn't even see it coming. I wonder what he was yelling though. I'm gonna get you. Nah, whatever. The bond ran through the busy streets, eager to get to his favorite, and only place to get lunch. The fact that the streets were parting, as if to give him free way didn't escape his notice. Ha. Huh. At least that's a perk. They leave me alone. I should be grateful. They don't beat on me like they used to. I think I can still remember everyone, every single person that's done me wrong, it's in my mind somewhere. I'm gonna get stronger, just to show you bastards that I didn't need your help to get where I'll be. Maybe you'll be sorry then. He hoped they would be sorry. Finally slowing to a stop, he saw that he had arrived. Lifting one of the privacy flaps, he saw two of his most favorite people inside, they were his special favorites when he was hungry. Hey Ajison. Hey, Ayamonison. Hey there, my number one customer. Ichiraku hailed, smiling. His welcome was both a fact and a compliment, and he was sure that the boy was aware that it was both. Aim beamed when she saw the boy coming, and did her best to ignore the fact that two other customers at the other side of the establishment left when they saw Uzumaki enter. How are you guys? Naruto asked. We're doing well. You? The boy shrugged casually, knowing his own emotional turmoil, but not wanting to share it. Oh the usual. I got bored in class, and pranked Aruka sensei Maybe I can top it tomorrow. Naruto gave the two of them a fox-like grin. Again? Aim asked, sounding a bit displeased. Not that she would ever tell him, Aim liked to hear about his pranks or more specifically, seeing how it was therapeutic to him. Again? You would think he'd learn by now that I don't put water in my balloons. At least I didn't use oil paint this time I've got a heart. So how many balls are you having today, Naruto? I'm going to be honest with you, my radio just died, and I'd like to get a new one cutting him off in line. His daughter chastised him for his insensitive comment, as he tried to mollify her. I was only joking. The elder Chiraku chuckled. The usual. Yes please. For once, he prepared to sit still, as he waited for them to prepare his favorite meal. From the perfectly round dumplings, to the blemish-free pork and chicken strips, the smooth noodles that slid down the throat to the delicious broth that warmed his stomach comfortingly. As expected, Naruto lost his patience to his hunger-induced fantasies. Oji-san. I'm dying of hunger. Naruto whimpered like a struck dog. You're so melodramatic. Here it is. With that said, Aim placed down a miso ramen, another one with pork, and her father came out with one that didn't smell entirely right. Naruto's nose twitched. Oji-san, is that? Yes, Naruto. You haven't forgotten, have you? It's Tuesday. No? He was about to get up and run, but Aim reached across the counter and caught him by the scruff of his shirt. No. Come on, Naruto, the Hokage ordered us to give it to you. So hey, I think that if you become a cage, you can cancel it and force him to eat it when he's retired. She knew it couldn't happen, and he knew too. He still appreciated her sense of humor, and it helped bolster him a little bit. You bet I will. Now let's get it over with. Naruto reached for the bowl, looked into the bowl, and grimaced. Something wrong with Naruto? Ichiraku asked. You know, besides your poor diet ethics. It's an abomination. It's soup. I am deadpanned in response to the boy's melodrama. And I tried my best to make it more tolerable for you. I even had them soaking in miso spices overnight. I am replied in a complaining tone. Naruto looked into the bowl. Instead of being filled with noodles, meat, and dumplings, it was filled with spinach, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts. Damn. Well, he said hesitantly. He looked back over at Aim, who was waiting expectantly to eat. Well, if she could put an extra effort just for him to eat vegetables, maybe he could reciprocate. Maybe if he had more than one choice in restaurants, Naruto figured that he'd stay right here. They kind of reminded him of his family in Wave Country. I love you guys, he grumbled almost humorously, but I hope you know that I love you less on Vegetables Day. They smiled. So, Sasuke-kun, do you wanna? No? Well, how about? No? They were dejected. 
He'd already shot down both her invitations before even hearing them, only by using a single syllable word. She cowered like a dog with its tails between its legs. Later, Sasuke-kun. To which Sasuke didn't even bother to reply. The birding Ichiha sighed, and placed his chin in between the palms of his hands. As he sat on the park bench, he tried to take his mind off Itachi for once. The dope. Am I the only one who saw it? I could see that the eraser was going to hit his goggles, probably hard enough to break them, but it was like he was trying to decide whether or not to let it hit him. But he's just at last. I am stronger than him, more skilled. I am an Ichiha. But it was strange. Sasuke could be prideful, and he acknowledged that. He could also accept that other people were stronger than him, and he knew that his own despised Anu was many times more powerful than him. What he couldn't accept was the fact that Naruto could actually be stronger than he looked, more skilled. If it really is like what I saw, why not let it hit his goggles? I know that they're cheaply made, and sold at a discount price because they lack a meaningful purpose. Is it the goggles that he's fond of protecting? Or are the goggles hiding something? Suddenly, the Chiha grinned. That's it. I'll just take the goggles from him. If he tries to protect it, it'll mean I was right. If he doesn't, then I'm just overestimating the dope. HN. Now, how to kill Itachi Sasuke walk off, falling back into his pastime of imagining himself torturing his traitorous elder brother. Though unrealistic, it was purely cathartic. Time skip. Ugh. Thanks I guess. At least old man Hokage won't force feed me again. You don't make it easy Naruto. At least you didn't run away this week. Naruto was exasperated. I attempted to. I would have gotten away if someone hadn't grabbed both my legs. He cast a half-hearted glare at him. He couldn't believe that the mild-mannered girl could or would do something to tackle his legs to prevent his escape. Well, that's it. No more of that Roman. Good thing I saved the best for last. The miso will help get the vegetable taste out of my mouth. At least until next Tuesday. Tuchi smirked. I'll just stay home on that day then. Naruto was feeling smug. Do you want the Hokage to send someone after you again? Naruto shivered. The last person the man had sent was no joke. He'd woken up in the middle of the night to see Anbu in an eco mask, had tied his limbs to the four corners of his bed. The Anbu went on to shove vegetables in his mouth, and then pinch his nostrils shut to make sure he ate it, so that he could breathe through his mouth. Not an enlightening experience, or one he wished to have again anytime soon. Or ever, for that matter. No matter how much he told the Ichirakus that it was traumatizing, they'd only laughed, be it in disbelief that it was a joke or merely ridicule. Well I'll see you later guys. By the way, I need the 20 bowls of ramen for next week, you know, in those takeout bowls you guys have. Sure, Naruto-kun. When, and where? The orphanage again. A masked, as she was given a small booklet of 20 sticky notes, all of them with an amateur picture of a whiskered smile. It was a drawing of a wide grin with three lines on either side of the grin, akin to aforementioned whiskers. One could say that Naruto drew his own grin, as a signature of sorts, no doubt done, as a sort of calling card or twisted autograph. Either way, Naruto's ego was heavily leaked into it, and it remained to be seen if it was a good thing or not. Since it's Naruto, I'll do top of the line service. It's a priority. Tuchi exclaimed. Naruto kun really. This picture. The brown haired girl last, dumbfounded. There's nothing wrong with it. Later guys. And with that, he jumped off the stool, and made his way home. So what's the picture of? The elder Ichiraku asked. Aim chuckled, and handed one of the pictures to him. He took it from her, and peered at it. Haha. <laughs> That boy is certainly eccentric still doesn't explain his attachment to that place, though. Naruto pushed open his door, and sighed. Home sweet home. Is it a boy? You know it's in terrible condition. Hell, even those orphans you're trying to treat with the ramen live better than you. Tenton lives better than you. Why don't you go live there? Not only is it a pigsty, you're surrounded by people in this district who all hate you. Maybe we should run away again. It's worked out before. Oh, what? Kyubi. Naruto answered in his mind, taking it back that he was being spoken to by his inner bitch, he was usually quiet. Isn't it your personal rule to only talk when I talk to you? And you know why I don't live at the orphanage. You're the reason. Besides, I'm not about to do something stupid. Do you take me for a fool? No. I take you for an idiot. What's the difference, wait a minute. Goddamn Kyubi. There was only a demonic sounding guffaw coming from the recesses of his mind. Naruto sighed. Sometimes, the Kyubi was tolerable, like now. Helpful on rare occasions outside of when Naruto was asking for favors, but otherwise just a pain in the ass. Otherwise tended to be most of the time. Naruto walked into the kitchen, and opened his fridge. Easy choice. Either water or milk. Sampling the milk, however, the choice dropped to one. He spat out the rancid milk directly into the sink drain in utter disgust. Bleh. I bought this milk two days ago. I'm just opening it. Kyubi. He yelled inwardly. What's today's date? Do you know? The 28th. Naruto reached for his notepad that he always carried around with him, and flipped to the part that was filled with names. Alright, shopkeepers. 
he continued to scroll through it. Found it. Says here that guy's name is Ishiro Suhin. Wait, this is the eighth time that fucking shopkeeper screwed me over. Is he hoping that diarrhea will kill me? Not very creative or likely, but it would be funny if it were possible, Kyubi commented. Shitting yourself to death. Ha. Huh. Trying his best to ignore the chakra monster's statement, the Uzumaki asked for what it called a coin flip. Spread a nasty rumor or just a normal prank. Naruto took a Ryo coin and flipped it. Rumor, Tails. The coin landed back in Naruto's palm. Ha, huh, you won again. You picked Tails for the past what, nine times? Nine times. Nine Tails. Is that some bizarre coincidence? Bullshit. I think you're manipulating the spin somehow. You gotta be cheating. The beast was nothing if not mock surprised. The nerve of you interrupting his line of speech, he felt something foreign pass through the seal. No, the crack. It wasn't actually a good thing, it was actually an eroded seal that he himself had made to help put a block on Naruto's eidetic memory. Things that had happened not worth remembering couldn't be held back anymore. Alright. Enough of that. Remember what I told you about the seal. The bitch finally broke. Get in here. It's time. I gotta take it off before you turn retarded. No, I mean more retarded. Naruto grumbled, there's just not a chain longer big enough for me to do things that you deserve, you bastard. Despite saying this, as if he was in a light mood, he was actually the complete opposite. I could feel it. I could start remembering some stuff recently. Like my birthday beatings, but in flashes. And some dude dressed in black that I'm supposed to kill. I thought I had more time. I don't want to remember all that. I'm happy now, aren't I? Kitsune did not answer for a while, but when he did, it was solemn. You can't afford to live in bliss anymore. Naruto put everything in order in the house before he laid down on the bed, as straight as a board with his arms at his sides. He tried to think of nothing at all, but soon, the seal embedded in his mind like a fish hook was slowly ripped free, and he couldn't stop himself from yelling his hurt until he fell unconscious. She walked through the village to where she knew his house would be, and more than a little worried. The academy school day was finished, and her favorite blonde had failed to attend. While he openly admitted no shouted that he hated the academy for having too much damn bookwork, he never skipped a whole day. Come running in at the final hour a few times, but never a full day. Besides, while he was reckless, he wasn't stupid, or at least that she was likely one of the very few who thought so. The genin exam was the day after tomorrow. He wouldn't want to botch his chances by failing to attend. Without even realizing it, she had walked straight into the district where Naruto lived. She sighed. She did it again, she let herself fall into a state of autopilot. Even though autopilot mostly ran on muscle memory, this only went to show that she visited him a lot. Air, visited him without him knowing. No, she was stalking him when he left his home daily in the afternoons. I could use his absence as an excuse to visit him. Is there? What if he isn't? What if something bad happened to him? Should I talk to somebody about it? It was too easy for her to get caught up in doubt, and what was worse was that it usually low-key led to self-doubt. What would I do if he doesn't want to see me? It was a rather pitiful state of mind, she reasoned, and she was fully aware of why. While she was pressured to be a perfect Harris for her clan, especially the elders, she got some constructive help from her mother, as well as her father from time to time. She did not have any ambitions such as becoming the head of the clan, nor her sister, and this detracted a lot from her drive to perform well. As for Hanabi, she merely wanted to be the first of the Haika capable of incorporating elemental chakra into the Jiken, gentle fist. It was presumed impossible, but that was the primary, and ironic, reason why Hanabi wanted to be the one to do it. Niji was even being considered to be a fullback heir, being born so close to the main branch, as well as being a prodigy of the gentle fist style in more than five generations. But he was particularly cold. He seemed to have some vendetta to everyone, but his parents. Perhaps only he knew. Perhaps the cause of her shy personality and self-doubt could be due in no small part to him. Suddenly, Hinata found herself in front of Naruto's apartment building, and she sighed, she had been on autopilot again. However, this poor mental reflex seemingly sabotaged her by leaving her to try to actively think about what her next move should be. When a while had passed, she realized that she had been standing, as still, as a statue with her hand poised to knock for more than 10 minutes. What if he doesn't want to be disturbed? She pondered using her by Akigen. It seemed like the safest solution. If he's doing anything that seems important, I won't disturb him. If he's casual, I'll knock and request admittance. She formed her unique hand seal. By Akigen. She immediately pinged into use with veins bulging around her eyes, enhancing her eyesight with the extra chakra. That must be him in the bedroom on the bed. Is he sleeping? Maybe I should just leave. But she looked a little longer. Something felt off. She knew that Naruto did not take afternoon naps. He was too hyperactive for that. Besides, he would have been training at this time. And why was he lying down in that position, akin to a dead man? And his chest wasn't moving. It was, as if he could be well, dead. That was when she finally processed that last thought. Dead no. With that, all self-issues went out the window, and hesitancy be damned. 
she took a step back and rammed the door. The lock easily gave way out of the dry rotting door jam, but the privacy lock and chain held fast. She rammed it again, and the lock came out with a piece of the door's wood stuck to it. She rushed into the bedroom and gasped, seeing her crush lying still on the bed. Naruto-kun. She was about to burst into tears when she noticed him take a small breath and exhale. Now relieved, she became embarrassed to practically break and enter his home when he was only sleeping. She stood and waited a little longer, trying to match her breathing with his, just in case he was actually having difficulty breathing, as she wasn't up for checking him physically she'd probably just pass out. Inhale after taking a deep breath, she watched and waited patiently to exhale when he did. Despite having taken a deep breath, she was still forced to exhale after a minute, and it was only for a while later before he exhaled. Something's wrong. His breathing is still much too slow even for sleeping. She checked his pulse at his neck and timed it. She was now grateful for all those hours she'd spent extensively reading about human anatomy when she was just starting to learn the Jiken. She checked him twice, but Naruto's pulse was barely 10 beats a minute and verified. Kanata was surprised and rapidly became anxious. It was as if he was hibernating, for lack of a better word. The Hakka immediately started to pace beside the bed. What do I do? What do I do? Call someone. Who? Give him CPR. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. She looked back to the object of her crush, as a deep crimson blush crept up her neck into her face, when her mind went into overdrive thinking of the implications. Kneeling down on the ground next to where he was on the bed, she tried to nerve herself up to try. But with her own face merely inches from his, her own hesitance and feelings for the boy stopped her, and superheated her face in a fiery blush. And, as sure, as night follows day, her thinking of Naruto like that led to fainting, and her head slumped down on his chest. Time skip. The gigantic nine-tailed fox grumbled to himself morosely. It had been 13 years since he was sealed. He could easily escape, with Naruto relinquishing control over to him so easily. In fact, this wasn't even the first time that he'd been able to, but the truth was that he didn't particularly care for escaping. He had his reasons, the most predominant of which was the fact that he had nowhere to be, not to mention the potential scenario that Naruto would die. There was also the argument that he was probably safer being jailed than being free, and being sought after by all the nations to be jailed again. Sure, he could fight them off, but he doubted he'd ever get to nap in peace again. Piyubi wasn't necessarily an evil being, especially considering that he was compassed of Yang, supposedly good chakra. Regardless of this, mentally, he was a neutral being, and did things when he felt given to act. He helped when he felt generous, destroyed entire landscapes when he was pissed, but otherwise just kept to himself. Minds were intangible, and basically all things alive had one. It was what really counted in a being, and it was specifically that which he was working on. Naruto's mind, that is. For three years, Naruto's had a seal suppressing the memories of his childhood. A recycle bin of sorts. The memories would have made him catatonic for life, and soured him, perhaps even making him mental. But, as any other trash can, there was a limit to what it could hold, but it could not be disposed of, as Naruto's abilities, and principally his eidetic memory made that impossible. Now, the memory suppressing seal was threatening Naruto's mental health, as well as his own. Naruto would go crazy, and the Kyubi himself would just become chakra without a mind. This random periods of behavior that would lack direction and purpose, so he was now forced to remove the seal. Hell, maybe the seal would have lasted longer if he was more proficient in Kenjutsu, he thought, as he finally finished. Boy, it is done. It is time to awaken. How are you feeling? Naruto's eyes exploded open. He actually had some potential responses ready. Never been better, was one, or even saying like a boss was an option. What he hadn't counted on was Hinata kneeling on the floor next to him with her head on his chest, completely unconscious. To the far left, his door was smashed at the knob, showing that the girl had broken into his apartment. Confused. She slowly came to, with her limpid eyes seeing only a blur. She blinked, as her vision became focused, trying to get her bearings. That's not my bedroom ceiling she thought when she stared up above her. Room color, had cracks, definitely not hers. Where was she? Are you awake now, Hinata-san? She looked around frantically, searching for the owner of the voice all the while still trying to figure out where she was. Probably tired of seeing the girl rubbernecking in her efforts to find him, the voice spoke again. Right here. She leaned her head all the way back while lying down. She now saw Naruto sitting behind her head in a chair adjacent to the couch she was in. Naruto Kanshi yelled, hurriedly getting up. She now remembered what had happened Naruto seemed on the brink of death, but now he looked as fit as a horse. I I, I was visiting you. Immediately her fair complexion went for a scarlet one. That's fair. So, what? You knocked, but when I didn't answer, you decided to break it down. He queried, pointing at the damaged door. No. I got worried when I saw you on the bed not moving. I was concerned. Was that before or after you broke down the door? His tone was cold, and so was his expression, making her worry. He was normally the type of person to take things in stride, and he never really had that sort of face for people. 
She took it hard to the crush would look at her like that. I used my Byakugan. I'm very sorry for breaking the door and violating your privacy. She was worried that he was angry with her, seeing his expression. Naruto was about to blow up, then seemingly stopped to consider what she said. To her surprise, her crush started to laugh. It started as a chuckle while he was serious, but he lost his serious expression by the time it turned into a deep-bellied laugh. Hinata stared at him stupidly. Trying to get himself together before he completely lost posture in the conversation, he cleared his throat. Sorry for laughing at you, Hinata. I guess it's alright since you were justified in your concern for me, even though it kinda makes me question why. The truth is here he choked and looked away, for someone to be concerned for me or even visit besides old man Hokage or the Ichirikus, or even if it were them, it means a lot to me. Thanks, Hinata-chan. He was so sincere that it was painful. Meanwhile, Hinata could hug herself in her joy and relief. He used to be affectionate with me. He likes me. Outside of her head however, her facial complexion had flushed so much that one would have thought that she was trying to impersonate a tomato, fortunately, she soon got it under control before Naruto looked at her again. Clapping his hands, he tried to clear the mood for something more light. Anyway, seeing that you're fine, thanks for coming by, and hopefully next time I leave and get a chance to clean up. With minimal effort, he escorted her to the door, as she allowed herself to be manhandled. See you tomorrow. Gotta get ready for that test, and I'll see ya. He closed the door behind her, leaving her out in the hallway. Were you? Now to get started. Little did he know that she was still frozen. He called me Hinata-chan. Now, she was impersonating a statue, and likely would for a while. Back on the inside, Naruto felt like something was off. Is she still there? Quite likely. She probably is. What do you mean probably? I meant to make sense to her. Kyubi shrugged inside the seal. Didn't have to. I can smell her scent. It's still strong at the door. It's coming in because the door is slightly ajar. Not shut. Remember that she broke it down. Anyway, do you think she will still be here to disturb what we're going to do? Naruto asked. Not at all. Now get back in here. Naruto complied and went back to his bed. Lying down stock still again, he closed his eyes and released his mind from all distractions. He soon felt a tug on his psyche and gave into it. Reopening his eyes, he was now greeted by the now familiar sight of the sower that was his mindscape. He wandered the tunnels with no general direction and soon found himself in front of the great cage with the nine-tailed fox behind it, just as usual. Took you long enough. Now let's get started. Kyubi's welcome king. Before we start though, my forehead feels like it's burning again. Can you take a look? The boy asked, rubbing his forehead. In fact, his entire head felt like it was on fire. It was a feeling he'd had before, and it was never pleasant. What, like three years ago? Kyubi was concerned, but at the same time excited. It was like a scratch ticket. He wanted to know what Naruto would get now in addition to what he had now. Yeah, Naruto replied. Come closer. The boy stepped into the cage, and stepped onto Kyubi's hand like paw. He then lifted the boy up to his eye level, and looked at the boy with an observing gaze. The boy trembled a bit, being in a discomforting position, as he was caught under the great fox's scrutiny up close. From what I can tell, the kanji aligning to the arrow says focus. Not sure what that means. I was hoping that the word describing the ability would be less obscure. Focus. You think it means a mental ability? Naruto asked. It could be, and it probably is. If it does mean mental though, it probably won't be a letdown, even though it doesn't sound as useful as memory weight. Kyubi had a thought cross his mind when he considered his final word. Dot, what is the shopkeeper's name? The kid soon suddenly tested. You sure, Suhin? The boy answered. What's today's date? Yesterday was the 28th when we started, so today's the 29th. The boy's eyes then widened considerably. Of course. The suppressing seal is off. The boy gave a wide grin, but soon frowned. I remember. Forgive and forget is once again impossible in your case, eh boy? You're now more mature to deal with the memories of getting your ass whipped by the village, anyway. At least you don't need to walk around with that shitty notepad anymore, or having to keep asking me for the damn date. And understanding seems to be active again. You're not as slow as a snail anymore. I'm still taking offense to all of this you know. Let it be. Do you remember the school's lectures? Yeah. I can. What I was awake for, at least, the boy jested in good humor. Despite his eidetic memory now active again, he felt better. The monsters could soon put down the boy, and snorted. Not the time for jokes. The exam's in two days, so you must study. Kyuba stopped to re-choose his words, and laughed, haha, I mean read teacher's books tomorrow. You won't forget it at all. But damn, these abilities are strange. There could be more of them waiting to be unlocked, this is an unusual bloodline limit. I have never seen nor heard of it before, and I have lived for centuries upon centuries. It could have been created in you, or it came into existence just a generation or two shy before you. Such simple gifts, yet the potential is virtually unlimited. 
Kyubi scratched his chin, now getting increasingly worried about the bloodline thief that was gunning after his container. Yo, you can leave. I'm tired. Kyubi yawned and settled down with his head in his hands. Kyubi the boy said hesitantly. The kid soon said tiredly, half opening a bloodshot eye. Thanks. You know everything. I'm gonna make sure that we find him and end the guy that killed my parents and got you sealed in me. I owe you that much, at the very least. Yeah, yeah. Sure. You're welcome, and all that emotional shit. Now let me rest. With a curt nod, the boy disappeared out of the mindscape, figuratively leaving the Kyubi by himself. I never could understand that boy. Maybe I need some of his understanding ability, Kyubi muttered under his breath. On the outside of the seal, Naruto opened his eyes, and waited for them to adjust to his overhead light, although he subconsciously believed that they attuned far more quickly than they usually did. He sighed tiredly with a hint of frustration in it. Yeah. I remember especially when I got memory. Is it a blessing, or a curse, making his way to the bathroom, he took off his goggles, and looked over his still aching forehead in the mirror. There were three concentric circles there. Two small arrows pointing to the east and west passed through the first circle. They had kanji in the circle at the back end of the arrow that said understanding and memory respectively. But there was a new one that the boy beheld. There was an arrow that passed through the first and second circle. The kanji was focus. Sasuke had woken up a bit surly. He had planned to find out what the dope had hidden under his goggles, or what was important about it. But Naruto had failed to attend the academy. Was he avoiding Iruka? No. That's stupid. In the past when he pranked Iruka in the morning, Naruto would come back to class in the afternoon. Why? The genin exam is in two days. He has to come today, if not tomorrow. Or he'll fail. Yes. Today's the day. I'll find out, one way or another. Even he himself didn't know why he was letting himself think or obsess over something so trivial, but it did occur to him that it was likely due to the fact that he was bored, and the academy itself was humdrum. He suspected that he was at the top not only because of his prestigious clan, but also because he practiced the most when he was at home, and he was the only one who did, save for a few like Shino and Kiba. The latter was probably practicing his clan's jutsu all the time, which would explain his dismal grades. But the tests were also tied in with practical knowledge, like shuriken throwing angles. That's why Sasuke reasoned that he was at the top. Just by training. He went about his hygienic duties, and prepared his breakfast. While leading, he thought of the final exam. Perhaps it wouldn't hurt to go over a book or two, in the event that he got a couple of irrelevant history lessons. What was he supposed to do, throw around useless history facts instead of shuriken? How the fuck would that kill his older brother? Regardless, his patience tested, Sasuke read. After finishing up, he left his house to make his way from the Ichiha compound to the academy. Along the way, he was greeted, as usual. Ohim, Sasuke-san. Hello, Sasuke-sama. This was the typical greeting from the civilian Ichiha. They could not reproduce the prize Shuringen that was sought after by the village. They disliked him, he presumed. The villagers in general kept calling him the last loyal Ichiha, as if the civilian ones didn't even exist. His brother had murdered all that were capable of using or reproducing the Shuringen. Those civilians mattered somewhat to Sasuke. At least for now anyway. Until his own Shuringen activated, he was one of them. He would play along with their hidden snide. Oh him. He answered. As soon as his Shuringen activated, his brother was going to be in a whole lot of trouble. Time skip. 497, 498, 499, 500. He pushed off one last time off his hands into his squat, then rolled backwards over the lateral side of his right arm. In the final moment of the occurrence, he backflipped neatly, landing on the balls of his feet on the very edge of the roof of his apartment building. Perfect. And that's that. Tomorrow's the exam. What are your plans for the day? I'm sure you don't expect to just walk up to the teacher and ask politely for his notes, do you? Actually, that's exactly what I expected to do. The boy's sweat dropped. Anyway, I've been thinking. You? Think. Didn't I warn you about that Naruto grumbled heatedly to himself. Once again, the Kyubi was acting like a pain in the ass. I have understanding again, okay. Damn. I know I acted like an idiot for the past few years, but it's over now. I guess so. You even entered the mindscape almost, as soon as you felt like it. Focus seems mediocre at first, but now I'm thinking of the possibilities. You could even perfect mind over matter. To think, you could be tortured, and you would be able to whistle through it all, simply by having your concentration elsewhere. Yeah. True. But I don't intend to get tortured anytime soon. Anyway, I've been thinking about the genin exams. Go on. Kyubi was curious. It all boils to 200 dot at this, the great fox was confused. That didn't happen often, and certainly not within the past couple of years. He prompted the boy to explain, and Naruto obliged him. Exam results. Think about it. It all comes to 200. In the exams, they determine team placements by combined scores. They place the top two of the class with the bottom of the class. It's like a sum to 11. 
1 plus 10 equals 11, 2 plus 9 equals 11, 3 plus 8 equals 11, and so on. I understand. The top two best in the class plus the last is like adding 100 plus 100 plus 0. As it gets closer to the middle, you would see something like 90 plus 90 plus 20 or 70 plus 70 plus 60. A sum to 200. In other words, Sasuke plus Sakura plus U equals shit. Kyubi now realized what his container was driving at. Yeah. It worries me too, especially having to go on a team with Sasuke, even though I really don't mind Sakura that much, despite how punch happy she is. But think about it. We could use this knowledge to manipulate who we could want, as a team. Naruto was growing excited, but his mind did not wander thinking of the possibilities. Naruto went about his normal hygienic activities while he kept up the discussion. Let's see. Using numbers, without counting those ordinary civilian ninjas. They have nothing notable. They all average out each other. Sasuke, 95. Sakura, 95. Shino, 90. Hinata, 90. Ino, 80. Shujai, 80. Shikamaru, maybe 30 or 40. Kiba, 20. Me, 10. Naruto snorted while Kyuubi laughed out loud. You had it coming, boy. What with falling asleep, and truancy in the mornings, and whatnot. You know it wouldn't have made sense anyway. My memory sucked at the time. True. But you could have taken notes. We're straying from the issue. By now, Naruto had donned his new outfit. It's safe to say that I, Ichiha, and Haruno will be a team. Inuzuka, Aburam, and Haka will be on another team, and the last team will be a repeat of Ino Shikacho, the encompassed of Yamanaka, Nar, and Akamichi. Let's see. The members of Ino Shikacho are out. Besides, one's perpetually lethargic, one needs to constantly eat to store fat, and has no stamina to support his weight, and Ino he grimaced. Gives Blonde a bad name. Oh, as if you were any better. He ignored the jab at his intelligence. I don't want Ichiha stuck up on my team, and maybe I guess I don't want Sakura on my team after all. That leaves Kiba, Shino, and Hinata. You should definitely go for the hike there. She obviously likes you enough to visit you when no one else would. Kitsune did not mention that the girl was infatuated with him though. He was content to let his container figure it out. He would simply count the days it took him before he realized, starting with today. It still didn't appear likely, and the Kyubi low-key got the feeling that Hinata would have to yell it into his face. I guess that part about Hinata makes sense. That leaves in Yuzuka and Aburam. Shino seems to be the most chill out of all of us, and he's pretty smart too. Kibra, now, would probably be constantly fighting for dominance like his clan. They act like dogs, fighting to be the alpha. They imbibe it from their mother's milk or something. He would be the easiest to manipulate, or the easiest to cheat out of a team. But if ends up on my team, it'd probably be a daily pissing contest with him. Sounds like a plan. Well, get going. You will have to talk to the mutt before the day is out. He grabbed his goggles, and strapped it onto his forehead, concealing the symbol. Yeah. That's right I'm Naruto Uzumaki, new, and improved. He rushed out the door, but had to pause in order to stop the door with some paper in the jam. I really have to get the door repaired later. Thieves could just walk right in he mused. What do you have worth stealing? Trying his best not to yell out loud at the Kyubi for not his constant immature teasing, Naruto ran to the academy. Having arrived early, he stopped at the institution's library, and picked up a book about Kanoha's history, and went into his classroom. Mizuki was the only one there, preparing for exams tomorrow. The silver-haired man noticed the boy's entry, but not who he was. Not caring to chat up the man, the Uzumaki only grunted out his pleasantries to the teacher, who replied with Ohim for standard courtesy. Naruto sat in his seat, opened his book, and read while he waited for his classmates to arrive. He didn't have long to wait, and soon the rest of the students arrived in bulk, and Iruka followed after he must have driven them inside when he saw them loitering outdoors. Being in the lead of the group, Kiba was the first to notice someone sitting with a book in front of where the face would be. He thought this to be strange, normally, everyone would remain outside until class began, a postponement of sorts. If he was there already, he was enthusiastic about learning, not to mention the fact that pretty much everyone had been outside already. Hey, new guy. What's your name? Kiba asked loudly. Naruto dropped the book on the desk. Everyone gasped. Naruto had shaved his hair to a lower, and more manageable level, while still retaining its spikiness. As for clothes, he now wore black ambu-style pants that were ankle-length, revealing grey shinobi sandals. He also wore a long sleeve midnight blue shirt that was zipped right up a close-fitting neck that had a bandana around it that was littered with red streaks throughout. The shirt itself had a hut that was currently down. In addition he had a 21-inch tan, the handle was 5 inches with a single palm grip, on his back in such an angle, that it positioned the handle of the blade over his right shoulder. The look was complemented by some sort of cylindrical sheath that rested perfectly horizontally just behind him on his waist. In fact, the only thing that Naruto retained from his old outfit were his goggles. It spoiled the new look somewhat because of its mismatch in scheme color, but not much. Naruto is it you? Iruka was stupefied, and a body of students were shocked beyond belief. 
Shuruka sensei, it's me. The boy answered. I only got a haircut, what's the big deal, huh? Now hearing the boy's voice, Mizuki looked up for the first time from his paperwork and observed the development. What's that damn brat up to now? He muttered under his breath before clearing his throat to speak up out loud. Naruto. Nice outfit. Finally decided to have mercy on our eyes by getting rid of the eyesore of a jumpsuit you owned. What inspired you to wear these clothes and get that 10? Mizuki asked cheerfully. Getting serious for the exam when it's almost here. Something like that, I guess. Naruto answered. Eruka was surprised. He could tell from the boy's aura had changed in the single day he'd spent away from school. He still retained his eccentricity, but the facts were there. New clothes, explained his situation in six words, weren't excitable. Clothes didn't necessarily make people brand new, but this was a brand new Naruto. Ha! Look at him, trying to act all tough. Bet he still can't even do anything worth a damn, Kibble laughed scornfully. Akamaru, the boy's companion dog on his head, barked somewhat unsurely. Naruto frowned a little, but soon let a smirk dominate his features. Haha. <laughs> hey Kayu, I just found a way to manipulate the Inu here. It's convoluted, yet simple. It can't be lost. What is it? The fox was now interested. Naruto was becoming increasingly clever, he could admit that. But the day when Naruto's intelligence succeeded is might be soon upon him. Think. He's very arrogant, like most Inuzukas are, but they're primarily Tijutsu specialists. If he loses a Tijutsu match, he'll try to mend his pride by investing all his time to improve on it only, so he could win a grudge rematch. He won't cram for the written exam so he'll fail that. Even if he gets perfect marks in Tijutsu and the Three Academy. He'll still barely pass, but in dead last. He'll still barely pass, but dead last. They finished at the same time. I'm proud. I would have tried to do something more sly and painful, but you do something less underhanded that will also teach that mud a lesson. The beast said in amazement. Dot, I forgot how smart you were. Why the hell did we suppress your abilities in the first place, anyway? Yeah, yeah. Now let's see if we can cut him down to size. Is that so? I can't do anything worth a damn. How about a Tijutsu match then? He asked the Inizuka, already knowing what the end result would be. Who do you think you're talking to, dead last? Kib adjusted. The other students now began laughing at the whiskered boy, boosting Inizuka's ego. I'm talking to an Inizuka mutt with dog breath. Or is he gonna run away with his tail between his legs? Naruto now turned the students against Kiba, and they all ooed when they heard his comeback. Say Ruka-sensei, it's alright, isn't it? It'll help us prepare for tomorrow, and you weren't gonna teach anything today just before the exam, were you? Naruto asked. No Naruto. Just revision. But I still don't approve. The Ruka remarked with a resigned groan. I say let them go at each other. Can't last longer than 15 minutes. So long as they pay attention in class for the rest of the day, I've no qualms. Mizuki gave out his opinion. Ha, shouldn't last more than 15 seconds. Inuzuka is going to rip the little shit to shreds, especially now since he's angry. Should be fun to watch. He thought. Alright. I guess that's true, Yumino conceded. He still didn't want this to proceed, but he really didn't have a choice. If it didn't go through, his students would heckle him for the whole day. And besides, if Naruto ever deserved some sort of karmic action for a prank, particularly a recent one that was pain related then this was fair, although he hoped Kiba wouldn't kill him. Time skip. The student surrounded the sparring circle, and Sasuke pushed his way to the front. While he wouldn't admit it, he was eager to see if his questionable theories on Naruto were true, that being whether or not he was actually concealing his skills. Perhaps even more interested in Naruto's welfare, but too hapless to try to go through the crowd to observe more closely, Hinata activated her Byakugan to see through the crowd, and marked Naruto out, as usual, because of his uniquely large chakra coils. Naruto handed his tent to Shikamaru, mouthing to him to keep it for him. He then took his place on the mat, where Kiba was doing stretches. Ready, mut. Desu watched the boy growl back. Naruto, what about that? Iruka pointed at the holster peeking from behind Naruto. He wasn't sure what it was, but he was sure that it was a weapon of sorts. What about it? Dijutsu match you know, hand to hand. It's in case Akamaru intervenes. Naruto said shortly. And in case the dog boy gets feral, and claws start coming out. Kiba was born with the ability of the claws from his nails. Tools. Naruto retorted. Excuse me. Iruka was confused. They're all tools which assist him, just like how clan would have bloodlines, and techniques like the Shuringen, the Byakugan, or Shino with his insects. They're all tools which assist them, as are my weapons. Naruto explained. As if I need Akamaru my claws to beat the likes of you. The Inuzuka called. Iruka was shocked. Naruto had defended himself eloquently, and since when did he have the moxie to teach? Iruka decided to just give, he'd been doing a lot of that lately. Naruto seeing Kiba finally settle into his pouncing stance went into his own. He stood sideways to Kiba, positioning his left foot facing forward towards him with his right foot behind him, pointing to the right. 
Most of his weight seemed to rest on the left leg. Also, he stood mostly on his toes, and his outstep while his arms were loose, hanging a bit limp. The students were all thinking that it was not the academy stance. Some said it looked weak, some said Naruto made it up, and still others laughed. Honestly, Mizuki was a bit more fascinated in the stance than most, but was far more interested in the coming beatdown. He stepped forward, and started the match by swiping down his hand. Hajim. Kiba, deciding to end the match quickly, sprinted at his opponent, thoroughly intending to knock Naruto out with only one punch. That'd teach him not to overstep his place. Naruto angled his head to the side, and caught the offensive arm, and pulled on it, adding his opponent's running momentum, and pulled Kiba past him. While he passed him, he stuck his foot in the way, chirping him. Kiba's face planted instantly, and all the students laughed at him. He jumped back up onto his feet, seething. He had been careless. Naruto was stoic, and that only served to piss him off more. He threw punch after punch at him, kick after kick, each being countered, and him being thoroughly embarrassed with each passing one, as well as growing tired. Akamaru barked concernedly from the sidelines. Finally, he decided to kick Naruto below the belt aiming for his groin. Naruto, seeing that he wasn't going to give up, decided to go on the offensive. He sidestepped the kick, and delivered his own kick to the back of Kiba's leg behind his knee, pointing upwards. Gasping in pain, he abandoned the failed kick, holding his leg. Naruto didn't give him a chance to recuperate, kicked away Kiba's pained leg, delivered two quick punches to his side, and one to his gut. Kiba tried to yell in pain, but all his air was pushed out of him. With his head about to hang down, Naruto dropped into a crouch, and delivered a powerful haymaker to his chin, that made his head snap backwards in a hurry, lifting him up off of his feet, and making him land on his back. Suffice to say, Kiba got knocked the fuck out. Naruto, now done, looked around at the crowd of students, as if daring someone to say something he didn't like. Thanks for watching my video, and make sure to check out the author of this fanfic, link is in the description, see you next time, till then sayonara.